Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. And we're actually lucky enough to almost have a sunrise. And at 19 degrees centigrade this morning, which is 66 degrees Fahrenheit, it's positively Arctic temperatures here in the Sabi Sands, which is where we are coming to you from. Welcome to Safari Live. My name is Jamie. I have Andrew on camera with me. And boy, do we have an exciting morning lined up for you. So for those viewers who were watching the Juma Dam camera this morning and spotted the leopard, a big thank you to Kevin and to Valerie, Ravi, and many, many others for your updates about the leopard that wandered across the dam wall. Scott shot off first thing this morning. He's out on tracking team, uh, completely abandoning all efforts at, co at coffee to go and find that leopard for you. And he's just come upon it now and Brent is on his way. I have Andrew on camera this morning and Tebs is on camera with Brent and we have exciting stuff for you. So without further ado, I'm going to send you over to Brent. Don't forget to send through your questions and comments. Enjoy the lesson. So a really warm welcome to Safari Live. Even though it's a bit of an overcast, chilly morning, my name is Brent Yosmith. We have Tebs on camera, and we have Tingana having a snooze next to us. So, a nice big dominant male leopard. So, a big thank you to all the viewers who let us know he was at the Juma Dam Cam. And another big thank you to Scott. Uh, while we were getting the vehicles ready, he went out in the tracking vehicle and managed to find him. Hopefully, he's not going to be snoozing the whole morning. And there we can see, oh, tired kitty. So just a reminder to any new viewers out there that you're seeing this male leopard at the same time as I am. Uh, this is Safari Live. So we are live on an African safari and we're sitting with probably the most elusive and beautiful of Africa's big five, a large male leopard. And he's snoozing about five meters from the vehicle. So what a great way to start the, the safari with a male leopard. Uh, and I know quite a few of you are probably wondering, don't worry, I'm okay after my encounter with the Inyala yesterday. Uh, just a little bit bruised uh, and a few little cuts and stuff from the glass, but we'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, let's focus on what we've got right in front of us. So Scott and Nikki actually heard him calling this morning before we went out on drive at about 4.30. And then he popped up at the Juma cam. And again, a big thank you to all the viewers who let us know which way he, he went. There's a little, little bit of confusion early on, but fortunately, managed to find out which way he went. I'm hoping a nice cool morning. We don't know how far he's walked over the night that he's going to start moving again. Oh, what did you hear? I think it's incredible that even at this time in the morning, the flies are already out. So lots of happy viewers out there. Cindy says, beautiful Tingana. And obviously we're very close to this incredible animal. And uh, Eric in Virginia Beach is wondering, if you actually are on safari with guests, what does it sound like? So while he's doing a snooze, I'll give you a, a pre-game drive safety talk. Uh, normally you would, before you head out on safari, you would brief everyone. And uh, 
it's very basic sort of uh, please keep seated at all time um, standing up breaks the outline of the vehicle uh, it shows the bipedal form of man which is the dominant diurnal predator so it can cause animals to behave negatively when you're close to them either causing them to run away or be become aggressive neither of which we want also please don't grab any branches uh, a lot of them have thorns rather try and move out of the way and watch for hand signals from your guide or tracker What do you, what does he listen to or see? Oh, there's a hyena right here. Come white it. The hyena hasn't seen the leopard, he can smell it. There we go. Watch, 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 watch. Come wide onto, onto the leopard. Sometimes big male leopards like this will actually attack a hyena. So the hyena now knows where the leopard is. No, he knows where it is. But he also knows that the leopard has probably not got a kill to defend, so no real reason. And look at this now, the hyena's between us and the leopard. <laughs> There's a little snarl. So a hyena is probably a lot stronger, or is a lot stronger than a male leopard in a one-on-one -on -one battle, but neither of them want to risk an injury um, without any necessary, and there's no, there's no food here. And you can see his ears flat. And I mean, a lot of you guys who have cats at home will recognize some of those very distinct uh, signs that the animal's unhappy. The hyena has now decided that this is not worthwhile. He is double checking around to make sure that they're always behind the, the, the aerial. Um, just double checking to make sure there's no food around here. And it looks like decided that it's not there and he's heading back off towards the Juma Dam. So encounters between these predators happen constantly out here in the bush. Uh, obviously, we're not there for all of them. And uh, obviously, when there's food or meat and stuff, there, the encounters can vary very differently. And lion and, and with different predators. So if that had been a lion walking up here, uh, Mr. Tingana would be heading off at a rate of knots. Uh, Leopard and Iena have a very interesting sort of a dynamic between them. Big male leopards like this uh, will quite often actually attack single hyenas um, if they're defending meat or, or become particularly harassed by the hyena. Uh, but as soon as that, the hyena numbers get to two, uh, the leopard will definitely move off. Welcome to Wendy from New York as we sit with Tengana. Um, Wendy would like to know how far is he from the Juma Dam camp? Um, he's just looking back there. The hyena's not there anymore. I'm just double checking. Uh, but he's probably about a kilometer now um, to the east uh, of the dam. So if you're sitting, pretend we were sitting underneath the camera uh, looking towards the waterhole. Um, he is to the right um, and directly from the dam to the northeast. So if you look directly across the dam from the, from the camera, that is north and to the right is east, more or less, not exactly, and to the, to the left is west. I was hoping that the hyena might inspire some movement. Um, but it looks like he's happy to snooze for a bit longer. So a wonderful welcome to Mauricio from Texas. Mauricio would like to know is Tingana in the middle of Mvula's territory? Well, Marissa, I think we can quite safely say that this is now Tingana's territory, uh, no longer Mvula's territory. Uh, but yes, it's, it, it is what is traditionally considered to be um, part of the core area <clears throat> of Mvula's territory. But over the last four or five months, Mvula has been pushed further and further to the east. 
Tengana now often ventures into Buffalo's hook and Torchwood. Uh, and Mvula has been pushed even further to the east. And he is getting quite old now. And you can see, I saw some pictures uh, posted by Nkoro. He is looking like he is losing quite a bit of condition. And as sad as that is for a lot of you who like the leopard and Vula, that is natural behavior uh, and it is bound to happen. Uh, he is, I think he was 12, 12, 12 or 13 years old. And Mvula is not a particularly big leopard. And so, so he was born in 2005. So 11 years old. Uh, so, and he's not a particularly big leopard. Uh, physically quite a bit smaller than Tingana. And, and Tingana, who's a, he's a really impressive specimen, is smaller than the Anderson male. And one of the reasons Tingana has pushed into this, what is traditionally uh, Mvula's territory, is because he's been pushed by the monster uh, Anderson male. So obviously out here in the African bush, specifically with leopards and male leopards, size is important. So while Tingana catches the snooze, let's go from some spots to stripes with Jamie. I quite like that comparison from spots to stripes. And we have a herd of zebra that's just wandered onto twin dams from across our southern boundary. I've headed here to see if there's any signs of lions crossing, but instead we got a zebra crossing. Ha ha, oh dear. Now, I know that you saw that wonderful sighting of the wild dogs yesterday with the zebra. And there's a couple of very pregnant females there that have now disappeared behind the tree line. But there is nothing much more picturesque than a zebra in the morning light. Or a tree in this case. Trees in the morning light are also very nice. Let's try and get you a view of the animal. yesterday that incredible sighting that you had with Scott for those of you who missed out on the sunset safari yeah, Scott had the wild dogs paying very close attention to a zebra herd with two little foals and I'm pretty sure this is a different zebra herd I haven't seen any youngsters coming through although they are imminent there's the stallion keeping a close watch always moving around at the back of the group to help to keep them safe and if that lady wanders in, oh, no, wait, actually, that looks like two stallions. Never mind. I was going to give you a nice comparison between male and female. But we've got two males there with their thin stripe underneath the tail. And you can see what I mean about how picturesque they can be in the morning light. Tail's already going furiously to sweep away the flies. I'm actually quite surprised that the flies are out this early. It's a bit chilly for them. They're going to wander off down the road, accompanied as always by the little black bird that is the fork-tailed drongo. And I said that there's not much more picturesque than zebras in the morning light. There is something that is more picturesque, and that is a male leopard. I'm going to send you back across to Tingana. So, as we can see, Tingana is doing what big cats do best, and it's quite often sleep. And leopards will sleep for an average of between, all around between 16 and 18 hours a day, sometimes a bit longer. Obviously, sometimes a bit shorter, but if we average it out. So, we don't know how far he's walked. As I said, he could have come from miles away. So, 
good morning to Julia from Houston, who's listening to all the bird calls around us at the moment. I'm going to just keep quiet for a second so everyone can hear them. prominent one we can hear is that very repetitive uh, down towards the Mawasi drainage line, so directly behind the leopard. Uh, and that is, uh, sounds like one of the, the canaries uh, making quite a lot of noise. And we've got some starlings we can hear, virtual starling. I heard some parrots. Um, brown-headed parrots squawking in the distance and we could also hear a white-browed scrub robin and a crested franklin. Oh, is one of my favorites. Very beautiful chortling sound is a black-crowned chagra. One of, definitely one of the prettiest calls in the bush. back shrike in the distance. So it's been really fascinating uh, since, since I started uh, in terms of cats and territories. And we've had two major sort of upheavals, one with the lion, one with the leopard. Uh, and obviously the Birmingham boys ousting the Matimba males, uh, which was a lot more sort of visible and, 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 and we could hear it a lot more, uh, that whole interaction. And the Matimbas are now stationed on the Sand River to the south of us and the Birmingham's are well set in the northern Sabi Sands. The other, which is a little bit more subtle, was the, the pushing of Mvula by Tingana. And they were seen together a couple of times uh, by the Juma guides. And quite often with male leopards, uh, the f it's, it's less about fighting and more about posturing. They'll be very close to each other, sometimes five meters, and a lot of growling, snarling, and calling and scent marking uh, while walking opposite each other. And with a lot of these animals, they know that a fight could prove to uh, become a major injury. So a lot of posturing is, is sort of better than actually physically in actually fighting not to say that they don't uh, but in my experience what i've seen is that the female leopards seem far far quicker to fight for territory um than than male leopards and they do get that incredible sort of almost foaming at the mouth when they encounter uh, an invader or another member of the same sex in their territory and we saw that very clearly with uh, shadow and karula when they came close to each other and lots of sort of salivating and it almost looks like they're foaming at the mouth. And here we go. You can see that lovely white underbelly, slightly softer than the rest of the fur. Um, and even though that is probably the fluffiest part of a leopard, uh, the hair is still quite coarse. Here we go. Have a look at those paws. Carolyn in Chicago. I was wondering how big his paws are. So that's the back paw. And that's uh, quite a bit smaller than the front paw. If we look at the front paws, we can't see the bottom. And you can see they're a lot wider and bigger. Uh, obviously, there's a couple of reasons for that. There's more bulk in the front of a leopard carrying his, uh, his weight. And also, that's the business end. So when it comes to grabbing something or fighting, So we'll, we'll be back discussing Tingana's paws, but off to another spotted animal with Jamie. Hey, look who we've got here. And it's calling. Come on, 
you can do it. You can do a nice loud one for us. <laughs> I love that sound. She almost sounds like a cow, the way this one's calling. So these low contact calls sound quiet to us, but to hyenas, they'll be able to hear that a couple of kilometers away. I'm waiting to see if this one does the loudest call it can. that you've just had a sighting with Tingana and another hyena that wandered through and happened to encounter him and Tingana paid him very little attention or just gave him a bit of a snarl. And I've seen hyena and Tingana interact before. Brian, you were wondering if a hyena is really stronger than a male leopard? And yes, for the most part. Maybe a small sub-adult hyena or a small male might not be. But even a hyena of this size is close to Tingana's size and weight. Although I think it would be a fairly interesting fight. Tingana is one of the biggest male leopards out here. But for the most part, these carnivores tend to follow quite a strict hierarchy. And within that, the leopards seem to automatically, not necessarily all the time, but quite often, will assume a slightly subservient role to avoid being injured. It just takes one bite of those hyenas to break or damage a paw or a leg, which in turn compromises that leopard. What's up, hyena? You're trying to call for the rest of your clan. Not getting any answers that I can hear. Now, we've seen and heard of leopards fighting hyenas before. I know that you had a sighting with Kunuma where he tried to chase a hyena away and then very quickly thought twice. Well, Kunuma's not fully grown. And I've even heard of stories of female leopards shooting down, grabbing their kill away from hyenas and then dashing back up a tree. So although they won't necessarily fight one-on-one, -on -one, leopards are a little bit faster, a bit more agile. So it's difficult to necessarily say a hyena beats a leopard every time. Lois, I don't know. I don't think it's pretty. Wait, back. Oh, they're so fast. And Lois, Lois, of course, is referring to one of the hyenas at the den. Uh, and Lucy, just while we're shooting around after this hyena, you wanted to know about the animal in the background. Andrew's doing a fantastic job. And there's a tree in my way. <laughs> Where did you go? That was quick. You see, it was an impala. And Lois, I don't think it was pretty. Jeepers, that hyena disappeared fast. Where did it go? The reason I suspect that it's not pretty is just based on size. It looks smaller than pretty. I could stand corrected on that. It's quite tricky to tell straight away which hyena you're looking at. Unfortunately, we are no longer looking at it. Where did it go? That was fast. Dash down into this drainage line somewhere, I think. I wonder if it's not on its way back to see if it can't find the rest of the plan. That, I suspect, is a occupied water burrow. There's a whole network of roads here I didn't even realize existed. Fascinating. I think this is an old hyena den. Wow. I've never been here before. This has been a fascinating experience. Look at that. In fact, I would not be surprised at all if that's not occupied. I don't think it's occupied by hyenas, though. I can't see any sign of our hyena friend coming through. I saw some flies flying out. So some flies around. Right, so what Andrew's pointing out is that there's flies around the entrance to the burrow. That usually means, well done, Andrew, good spotting. That usually means that a burrow is occupied because the flies are attracted by 
the various parasites and skin cells and so on of an animal. Look, we can see right inside. How cool is that? That's fascinating. Now, I'm pretty sure looking at those flies, they've got a pale color to them. There is one species of fly that is unique. Hi. Go away, bird, wherever you are. There's one species of fly that is unique to artfark burrows. They're attracted only to artfark burrows, and I think that's what we're looking at here. I think it is an old hyena den that's now been occupied again in a turn of affairs by an artfark. Just judging by, this is definitely occupied. It's got freshly scraped soil around it. Good morning. Where are you? Oh, there he goes. <laughs> Go away, bird shouting. Oh, well, that's been really interesting. <laughs> um, Raisa, you wanted to know if there's any hyena tracks on the road? There would be. I'll double check and see when we go back out again. I still want to... Oh, Ellie tracks. Sorry, yes, you wanted to know that if those were Ellie tracks. Well done. Mm. <laughs> well done, Ray. You see, yes, there's a big, big bull elephant that walked down Gowrie, Maine at some point last night. Well, that was an interesting little excursion. I've certainly learned a bit more about a network of roads I had no idea was here. I'm going to send you back over to Brent now as I negotiate my way out. Have a wonderful time. So we're still with the big boy, and you can see he's now gone even more flat than he was. And we're discussing his paws uh, and the size of his paws. So the front paws on most animals are much bigger. Uh, obviously, more weight around the shoulders and the head, so it's got to carry a bit more weight. Also, that's sort of the business end when it comes to hunting and fighting. Uh, leopards will use their back, back claws as well, but that's more... Uh, for climbing and occasionally in fighting if they get on top of another leopard uh, or on top of a possible prey. Spe uh, possible prey. But uh, a big male leopard's track, if we have a look my hand here, uh, is probably uh, around that sort of size uh, compared to a male lion, which would be almost the same size as my hand. So a male leopard's sort of the size of the palm of my hand where there's a male lion, almost the whole size of my hand. So, uh, Mr. Tingana, not doing too much at all. And what we will hope is that he does get moving. Uh, if he doesn't, I'm just going to sit here until Aubrey or Tax or one of the other game drives come and they can sit with him while he's sleeping. We might go have a look what else we can find uh, and then come back if he starts moving. to Sharon and thanks uh, Sharon in Pittsburgh and thanks very much Sharon uh, it's great to be back uh, and Vian and I are also quite glad we, we, we didn't come off too badly uh, with that very interesting encounter yesterday and Sharon would like to know do all big cats have yellow eyes have I ever seen any variations well Sharon uh, with leopards I have I've seen green eyes it's actually not that uncommon in leopards uh, and different shades of yellow and gold but uh, leopards sometimes do have green eyes. Uh, when lion and leopard cubs are young, uh, very young, they have blue eyes and their eyes change as they get older. So it looks like he's relatively well fed. And I'm not sure when the last time he was seen. So it looks, there's a little bit of blood around his neck. Um, it could be from feeding. It's more than likely I can see where we're talking about. It's about there. Um, for me, that looks like he scratched a tick. And um, it's popped. Yeah, so there we go. You see, it's slight pinkish tinge. You can actually see exactly where the tick was. Uh, and what happened is he scratched that tick with his back leg. Uh, probably one of those big, fat, grey ones. And it's, it's popped during the scratching, and that's what spread that blood around his neck there. So even 
know, a leopard looks like a very sort of parasite free and clean animal. They are covered in little ectoparasites, ticks and fleas, uh, and as well as some other nastier ones, flukes and whatnot. And you can see those wonderful rosettes. Oh, there we go. There's Tax. Good morning, Tax. Um, we've got Tingana um, on Central Road, just to the east of the concrete crossing or giraffe crossing. Just me, make your way. Okay, so it looks like he's going to continue snoozing. So we'll wait for, for Tax to get here. Oh, look at that. His little tongue sticking out there while he sneezes. And have a look at the nose there. So even though from a distance it looks quite pink, but you can, I mean, so quite black. It is a little bit pink. And uh, sometimes the color of the nose is used to age animals. And it's sometimes not the most reliable uh, indicator because some adults still have pink noses, as you can see here, he's got quite a pink nose. And then down to the, the oh, you can see there's a tick on his bottom jaw there and there's an, a few down to the right below his mouth. Looks like an extra spot almost. And, uh, sort of directly opposite the fly. Uh, that little fly species there is, is the bane of our lives here. And it is called a stable fly. Uh, very common around livestock as well. But it's the little biting fly uh, that bites us as well as the wild animals we view. And that's what causes the tatty ears uh, and quite some discomfort, especially in the heat. And little stable flies. They look very similar to a house fly, and they are a bit smaller, and obviously they feed on blood. Here we go, we can see the slightly tatty ears there from the flies. Oh, look at that stable fly, has gone right into where he's popped that tick. Um, you can see there, so where he's popped that tick, there's a stable fly actually feeding off the blood there. There could be an open wound. Are we going full zoom, Casey? Yeah. yeah. So there we go. Um, you can see that little fly coming out there feeding on the, on the blood. So obviously we're all very interested in the lineage of our leopards around here. And Tom and Patsy would like to know uh, we know sort of Mvula's lineage a little bit um, and his offspring. So we must be very careful. Oh, sorry, mis misheard there. Tom would like to know whether Tingana is an offspring of Mvula. Uh, he's not at all. Uh, Mvula comes from the southern Sabi Sands uh, around the Sand River and Sabi River. And he moved up into this area a few years ago. Tingana, no one's sure where he came from. Tingana means the shy one. He's not so shy anymore. Um, and so he just arrived in the northern Sabi Sands a few years ago. Um, my guess, and this is pure speculation, is that he comes from a property called Ottawa, uh, which uh, Singita Traverse, but it's a very big property uh, sort of to the west of uh, sort of Elephant Plains, Arethusa, Sibambili, that area. And it's got very, very few roads. And it is quite a thick property inundated with drainage lines. So there are quite a few unrelaxed leopards in that area. I used to drive around there a few years ago. So sometimes when you get unrelaxed leopards, um, he could have possibly come from there or he could have come from the Kruger. So when he first arrived in this area, he was not that habituated to vehicles. As you can see, that is a completely different story now. So if you do drive respectfully and calmly around these animals, as you can see, they become very relaxed in our presence. I'm sure the leopards have been enjoying the cool weather over the last few days. Uh, 
Sharon, Stuart is wondering what Tingana's distinguishing feature is. Um, if we have a look on the top set of whiskers there, if we go in, um, you can see there above that sort of last line of whiskers, there's a what we call a spot pattern. If I remember correctly, you can see there's four spots there, two almost together and two off to the left. If I remember correctly, he's a 5-4, so... What side are we on now? Yeah, five on the right, four on the on on the on the left. That's the main way to distinguish leopards, especially if you're not sure who they are. There we go. Hyena's back. Well spotted Tebs. It's a different hyena. Different, different hyena. It's making some noise. There we go. Look, this one looks a bit more serious about chasing him. And he's jogging off. Behind us, I'm just going to turn. Hello, hello, Howard. What are you up to? Chasing away our leopard. Now, can you still see the leopard, Tim? I've lost visual. Yeah, trouble. Naughty, naughty. So, coming to check if there's any food around. Oh, there he is. Okay. We've still got the leopard. Um, you heard me call the hyena Howard, and that's just a little joke. Um, I've got a cardboard cutout of a hyena that I used to, we used on a film shoot. Uh, it's life-size. So um, he's been nicknamed Howard. So all hyenas are Howard. There's Tex. So we're going to hang around here a bit because that hyena's here, um, causing a little bit of problems. So we saw a bit of that camouflage that a leopard is able to show, um, even lying right out sort of in the open. I'm just gonna have a quick chat with Tebs and Fanwell just to let them know what's going on. Yeah. The Amnesty just chased him. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. How are you guys? And oh, there we go. Okay, so. At least the hyena has prompted some movement and he's no longer a flat cat. So we we're just discussing his distinguishing features. And for me, it's that big, thick neck. He's quite a pale leopard. So remember we saw that little spot of blood on his neck uh, and you saw him scratching there. That is, I'm almost 100% certain about how he got that blood on his neck, popping ticks by scratching. But we have very exciting uh, fact here. We've got a new viewer called Tiara who lives in New York. And um, Kiara, sorry, not Tiara. Um, and she's a new viewer and she, she lives in New York and she's asked, she asked how to get her, her, her question through. And, uh, well, Tiara now, know, uh, Kiara now knows. And thanks to all the viewers who let her know how to send her questions through to us. Just a reminder for those of you who don't know, you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send us an email on questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, but Kiara's question is, how fast can a hyena run? So a hyena is uh, built for stamina rather than speed. They can still run faster than we can. Um, so they can, they can probably get up to about 60 kilometers an hour but the thing is they can maintain those speeds. Um, well, probably not 60 for too long, but they can maintain a speed of around 35, 40 kilometers an hour for up to sort of five, six kilometers. So they are incredibly well designed with that sloping back, uh, designed for stamina uh, rather than outright speed. And that huge strength in their, in, their, in their upper body with that thick neck and well-developed uh, sort of front leg muscles and shoulder muscles and again thanks to everyone for making uh, Kiara warm and welcomed here on Safari Live and hopefully you'll keep asking questions so the hyena seems to have moved away 
can't see it anymore, but that's the second hyena that's visited him this morning. And you saw how different the behavior uh, between the two different hyenas was, how the one sort of stayed away when he growled and sort of ran off. Uh, and the other one, obviously, maybe a more dominant female, was far more aggressive in her approach and even came up calling them. Like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And that moved, actually forced him to move. He didn't move very far, probably about 15 meters. Uh, but amazing how there's different characters and the different animals, and different animals will react differently uh, when they come across each other. Welcome to one of our regulars, Miss Jin in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Miss Jin would like to know whether Mvula would put up a fight against Tingana or just move away. Well, I'd say the fight's over, Miss Jin. Tingana has pretty much usurped Mvula from his territory, uh, and Mvula probably will not want to get into a physical battle with uh, Tingana. He's younger, he's bigger, um, and there's a strong possibility that he would take a serious beating from this leopard. So he has moved off, rather. Um, obviously, it's, we don't know what's happening further to the east of us. I know there are other male leopards that side. I'm, I'm going to ask Tax. Maybe Tax knows he can travel f further distances than I can. Well, are there other male leopards in Coral side? Just from Vula at the moment. Mm. Okay. Thanks, Taxi. Um, so there we go. At the moment, to the east, and Vula's got a little niche. There's no other male leopards currently in that area. There is one of, I know some of the viewers will know of him, one of Karula's offspring, Shavambalan, um, who is but further to the east in Kruger. So at the moment, Vula seems to find a spot. But obviously, as male leopards get older, their territories shrink as the younger males uh, push in. And it gets to a stage once there's no sort of gap in the territories where, where they can hide. Oh, there comes a yawn. Oh. Uh, not, not the biggest yawn. Uh, well, there comes a stage where these, these once dominant male leopards become nomadic. Uh, and they basically try to sneak between the different male leopards, avoiding confrontation uh, and just trying to survive. And it becomes quite a sad state to see. I mean, you see once magnificent male leopards looking quite mangy uh, and, and, and not well at all. And I've seen them eating lion feces to survive. Uh, and unfortunately, as with most of the predators out here in the African bush, there's no real dignified end to life. You're normally scragged by something else and, and ripped apart. Here we go. Up on the move as the first rays of the sun break through. And look at that. He's probably no less than four feet from me now. Or at least he's sent marking in that direction and not towards us. Isn't that beautiful? watching Tebs intently there. So, love three dogs from Texas, uh, who's become a regular viewer. Um, so why was Tingana calling like he was this morning? Um, we know females call uh, when they have cubs uh, or when they are in estrus. I'm just going to let oops, taxi go ahead of us for a second. We've had such a good viewing and we will just be leapfrogging between us to uh, the front spot. So while we do that, um, just answer the question quickly. Uh, so 
Tangana uh, and females will call. Females don't only call for those two reasons that you mentioned there. They also call for a territory. Most vocalizations that you hear from lions or leopards uh, are not actually uh, to call each other or whatnot. It's to, 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 to certain territory. So him walking around going, uh, 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 is to say all the other male leopards, hey, watch out, this is my spot now and I'll give you a hiding if you come here. Um, and so that's why, and the female leopards call like that regularly as well to defend their territory or to make it known that this is their territory. You can see I'm walking to the left of Tax's vehicle. Off on patrol. Now this is a very similar route to what Mvula used to do regularly. I remember a couple, just before I went on leave was the first time I actually tracked Tingana doing this whole route. And basically straight down Hippo Pools to Buffalo's Hook Dam, Nyala Road North, and then Central Road to the dam and working in both directions. So really fascinating. Uh, we have, had Tingana has been seen crossing north into Buffalo's Hook, so further north of here. So, I mean, this whole northern section, we know there's that unrelaxed male leopard that is uh, nicknamed Gajima by the guys in Buffalo's Hook. Uh, Gajima means the one who runs and he, he doesn't like cars. I've only seen him once uh, with Andrew and he disappeared very quickly. One of the distinguishing features about an adult male leopard is that dewlap. Oh, there we go. Scent marking with pre-orbital glands and then a little spray of urine. That's oh, quite a big one. And for those of you who are new, might not know, leopard urine has a, a really distinct smell. Uh, and for those of you who are avid movie goers, you go to the cinema at home, uh, I'm quite sure as you prepare to book your movie, you like to go get some popcorn, and some of you might like buttered popcorn. And leopard urine smells almost exactly like buttered popcorn, so quite an interesting one. And you can actually smell where they've been. Saying so, quite a tall male leopard, uh, probably weighs around 80 kilograms, um, which is sort of about, a, I think if my maths is correct, around 160, no, no, but more than that, 180 pounds or so. Um, Tax go ahead again. So, quite often, what we do is we'll leapfrog between, giving everyone a chance to. Let's go in front to get a good view of the leopard. So there's an update from Jamie on the radio. She's tracking the wild dogs at the moment. It looks like they've crossed north into Buffalo's Hook. Yeah, so there's a little sneaky maneuver I'm going to be able to move. Not quite yet, but the good thing about spending it incredibly uh, incredible amount of time out in safari and areas. You get to learn a few little shortcuts. Um, so where there's a gap between the bush, you can sort of zoom around and get up in front of the leopard. So as soon as that opportunity uh, comes along, I shall definitely do that. Here we go. Hoping he doesn't walk too far today. He is able to walk quite a big distance. Um, Leopards, if they wanted to, you could probably walk 15, 20 kilometers in a day in a night. They don't normally walk that far, normally so, uh, at the top end, five or six, but they are able to walk incredible distances. So, Terry in New York, 
Talk would like to know how far is Tungpano from Juma, the Juma Lodges, so where he was lying, probably about a kilometre, he's probably now about a kilometre and a half from the lodges. Nice that he's on the move. Fortunately, you guys can still see me, but there seems to be a little um, gremlin in the, the normal internet, which is different from our streaming internet. And uh, unfortunately, so we, we're not going to be able to receive your, your questions at the moment. Uh, but don't worry, we have tech people on it already. Oh, he's seen something. He's off on the hunt. changed his behavior there slightly. He might have heard or seen something just off to the bush over here. So I'm gonna sneak past him. See, so he's down, he's down in a crouching position. Look how flat he's getting to the ground. There's an Inyala, there's an Inyala just behind him. Go up, Tess. There we go, you can just see the Inyala. Okay, we're not gonna move now. We're gonna sit tight right here. Hopefully the Sinyala doesn't jump into the car. There's baby Sinyala there as well. Okay, so it's probably about 20 meters. Normally a leopard prefers to charge from about five meters. Uh, but it all depends on the situation. Now, a, a, an adult male leopard like this, he, he top ends at about 24 meters per second. So incredible speed over a short distance. They're not designed for long distance running. They're definitely short distance sprinters. Quite a big group of Inyala. So obviously in some ways that gives them a, a better chance. In other ways, it's more eyes to spot him. He shoots, yeah. Um, so the reason we're going to stay wide here is just in case he shoots off at a high speed, only 24 meters a second. Imagine trying to keep up with that with a camera. Thankfully, we've got awesome cameramen, like Tebs, VM, Andrew, and Brian, and jean -Dre. So they are more than up to the task. see things very easily from our height. So you must imagine now dropping down sort of more than a meter. So he is battling to see them now. That's why he's lifting his head up like that. He's probably just picking up little bits of movement through the bush. So then you know that are from there all the way through to there. See, 
almost looks like he's lost vision of them. Ah, there we go, he spotted them again. So there are some sub-adults and some quite young ones in there. There we go, he spotted the young one. Again, guys, apologies. Our normal internet's down, so we're not receiving any questions at the moment. But isn't this absolutely exciting? We've got the dominant male leopard, Tangana, probably about 30 meters or so away from a group of Nyala. Most of the Nyala just on the other side of that bush there. A little bit far for him to charge at the moment. But stranger things have happened. Quite a nice piece of bush for him to hunt. There's some thickets, good cover. There he goes. Now, see how he f he's flattened his ears and put his head lower. Uh, he's trying to make sure his distinct feline outline isn't visible. And that's years and years of evolution coming into play there. His ears are still scanning around, making making sure that there's no hyenas coming. So as I'm saying, it's still a bit too far. He's going to have to get at least another 10 meters or so closer. Leopard's preferred sort of distance for making that charge is about 5 meters. But they will go from about 15, 10 meters if they conditions are great. Look at those shoulders. Look at those muscles. And now, when a leopard's hunting like this, if you watch very carefully, his back foot will go exactly where his front foot is. So it has been to negate any breaking branches or noises. And they're very patient stalkers. Oh, the one, the Nyala's coming closer. This one, Nyala's coming closer. Nyala's probably within 10 meters. She's still coming closer. She's moving through this thicket here. Look how he's getting ready. He's bunching up. He's got his head down. That sort of latent energy of all those muscles. Oh, it's just on the edge of the range now. This is incredibly exciting, guys. of the Nyala are going to come through. You might wait for one of the smaller ones. There's a baby coming through. Uh, not this one more Nyala. So there we go, there we go, there's the baby. And there's another one even a little bit closer. It's just right on the edge of that range. Camouflage is working. So it's, as I said, it's just, just, he'd like to be a meter or two closer, sort of his ideal charging range. And there's still a few more Nyala coming. against the ground. So I think there's still another two or three behind those two on the left. I mean, he's, he's like a, almost like a rock or a log, he has not moved an inch. You can barely see him breathing.
always thought he was gonna go while that one stopped to clean itself. just too far. This is incredibly exciting. I think there's only one in Yala left behind. I can't really see. Has he missed his chance? It was just too far. He might try to come up from behind them. So they've just walked in the front of Tax's vehicle across here. Let's just see what he gets up to. You can see how his body posture's changed. They've, they've crossed the road now. Um, and as I said, it's just probably a meter or two too far. It's not to say he hasn't finished stalking them. He is quite full as well, so not desperate for a meal, but you must remember predators are opportunists. I think there's a Nyala have put enough distance between him and them now. If we look here, literally they were walking through that section there. If they had been there, sort of a meter or two closer, or he had been at the base of that tree, I think it'd be in a very different story. It's just that little bit too far. Uh, and you must remember, an animal like a leopard expends a huge amount of energy in that charge. Uh, so sometimes it's worth not charging. It's that, just that little bit too far. You can see he's got quite a nice belly on him, so he's not too hungry. But he is. The Nyala is still just on the other side of Tax. It looks like he is going after them again. There's a Nyala there. If you come up. There. Disappearing. Still a few there. I can't see where he is at the moment, but we're not going to move the vehicle just now. Just yet. So isn't this exciting? So it's been wall-to-wall -wall excitement since I got back. Spitting cobras in the kitchen. Inyal is on my lap. And now a male leopard stalking it. So, and he's just in front of Tax's vehicle. Trying to see what's going on. You see him, Tipsy? And Yala moved off. And there's still, there's quite a few of them there. As we saw, probably about 10. And they're almost opposite us now, so they're moving sort of parallel to where we are. I can't see where Mr. Tingana is. Is he going to carry on? On his patrol, is he going to start stalking these in the There's a, quite a few jokes now coming from Final Control. Uh, did I tell Tingana to be careful because Nyala are dangerous? Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. But yes, they are. They do have very sharp hooves. My ribs and head can attest to that. There he is. There he goes, there he goes, there he goes. 
Nala are running back towards him. Something spooked them. So, there's, you can see the Nala just to the left of the screen, and there's Tingana just behind that tree. There he goes, there he goes. There's the baby right there. Isn't this incredibly exciting? Again, it's about a little bit too far. He needs another another five meters, would be my guess, before it's sort of optimum charging zone. So they're about, I'd say, 12, 12 to 15 meters away. And he wants to be in that under 10 meter radius. It does look to be a, a termite mound just to the right of the Zinyala in between him and them. So that could be a really good aid. And you can see how camouflaged he is. And he's, oh, he's been spotted. Or oh, they're barking at something else. Is there another leopard here? It's possible. They're not looking at him while they're barking. And he's not sure. There we go. Right. Yeah. But I'm not sure whether they were barking at him. They weren't looking at him. But something else is going on. Oh, and off they go. Nyala disappearing in every direction. White fluffy tails bound. But wasn't that exciting? I mean, he got so close. Let me get my button. exciting and one must remember that with uh, the big cats lions and leopards and they only have a sort of a 10 12 percent success rate in every stalk and hunt that they have looks like he's off on control again There's a possibility that Nyala caught a whiff of him on the wind that would have caused them to alarm call as well. And as he's walking there, you can see his, how much bigger his front paws are to the back paws. He's not so worried about where he puts his feet now. But when he was stalking, uh, literally he'll put his back paw exactly where his front paw was. Getting a quick picture for everyone at Juma. Really nice shot with the Juma vehicle behind a big male leopard. So, guys, just to remind you, that was 100% live. We were hunting with a male leopard live, and it was amazing to be able to bring that to you wherever you might have been in the world. So, really exciting stuff. So we've been joined. Another vehicle, not sure who it is. I had my radio on. <laughs> Margaret on Twitter says, what an adrenaline rush, he's getting too old for this stuff. Now just to let you know, so Nikki and Kirsty are in final control. Uh, the normal internet is down, so Kirsty's actually standing outside with her cellular device, uh, getting updates on Twitter and then feeding them through to Nikki. So we've got an incredible team. Uh, 
trying to phone phone signal so we can get some of your questions through. Morning, morning, morning. morning. Hey, Andrew. Morning. Thanks. say whether he caught something last night he might have caught something small uh, but his belly does look like he has fed in the last few days he's changed direction again he's gonna stand by it so margaret yes you can breathe now you can relax it's not nearly as high intensity as it was and Anna Marie says that was so cool even though he didn't catch anything. <laughs> Obviously I wasn't really watching Tingana, I was watching where those Inyala were running just in case another one ambushed me. I think one in Yala in my lap is enough for a year. But Jamie's still out there searching for those wild dogs, but unfortunately so far she's only found a hornbill. So we're going to stay with Tingana for now. my sneaky spots we'll just wait for him to get past us should hopefully be able to get up ahead of him oh smell the buttered popcorn says spoiler alert and James Richard said is it possible that those uh, Inyala were barking at the hyena uh, very unlikely they don't normally bark at hyena um, they generally only the cats and they don't waste time barking at wild dog because they just got to get out of the way so I'm just going to try and get a little bit up ahead of him uh, hold on there Ted's even nearly there Should get nice, nicely ahead of him here, taking the opportunities the open ground on that road is given us. Our new viewer has asked another question. Thanks for keeping the questions coming, Kiara. Um, Kiara uh, would like to know, how do you tell the difference between a leopard, a male and female, without getting too close? It's the body size, generally. Kiara, if you can't see the obvious um, extra appendages from the behind, uh, the males are, are quite a lot bigger uh, and heavier. So a male leopard like this will weigh around 
80 kilograms, where there's a female like Karula, which is our dominant female, probably weighs around 35, 40 kilograms, so 50% the size uh, of a big male. I'm hoping he walks straight up towards us. You know, Hansen would like to know, do the big cats cough up fur balls like house cats? Brian, they do. So what we've done is we've moved down to the, the bottom of the hill. So apologize about the black screen. The signal can be a bit iffy here if we're moving. So that's why I've stopped. And he's probably going to walk around the corner in the next few seconds and hopefully walk either right next to us over here or right around here, depending on which way he goes. Unfortunately, if he goes up to the right here, um, that is a really, really bad signal area. So hopefully he decides to carry on straight because this area is not really good for signal. So as I was saying, Brian, they do cough up fur balls. Can you see me at Tibbs? Oh. Did he change his direction? Have a look with the binos. He might have stopped to listen. So Tax and I have sped around here to wait for him to walk past us. And it seems like he's... Uh... Oh, here we go. There he is. Here he comes. To see movement through the bush. And one, there he is. About to pop around, there he comes. So guys, remember this is live. You are following an African male leopard uh, with Safari Live. Uh, you're seeing this at the same time we are. And remember, we're also able to ask, answer any of your questions you might have about leopards and other animals in the bush. You can do that by sending us an email on questions uh, at wildearth.tv, but at the moment we're having a bit of internet issues, so uh, only on Twitter. And you just use the hashtag Safari Live, uh, and that should hopefully get through to us, and we can help explain any conundrums you might be wondering around, uh, wondering about leopards or the African bush. Oh, isn't that magnificent? So Kiara was wondering another way to tell a male leopard. As you look under his throat, you can see that loose skin, which we refer to as a dewlap. It's another very distinguishing feature of male leopard as opposed to a female. 
So those of you wondering what that clickety click is, sorry, that's just my camera. I'm getting a few shots. It's such a beautiful scene. And remember, you guys can take screenshots and don't forget to share them with us. You can put them on our Facebook page, which is Safari Live, or just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter so we can have a look at all your wonderful screenshots. Of course, he's going to go off the road. <laughs> right where we were hoping he was going to sneak right past us. So, as you can see, this is alive. We can't plan what he's going to do. We've just got to try our best to be in the right positions at the right time. Maybe he's heard something or smelt something he wants to go have a look at there. Nisa from Wisconsin and Nisa is saying she's just so impressed how the trucks don't seem to bother this leopard. Uh, well, these leopards are very habituated. Uh, he actually didn't grow up with vehicles as a, as a small cub, but he um, has come to find vehicles in his older age. And the guides here are all very experienced. We drive very carefully as to minimize our effect and you can see the Nyala and the Leopard take no notice of the vehicles. He might have heard something and just he's looking off into the distance there. And just make his rosettes out behind that stump there. And bro, what is doing the lullaby? Yeah, he's lullaby. So look at that for camouflage. I was spotting for him now. I think he's gone flat cat, so we actually look under the log. That dark log. Just make out a rosette underneath there. and listening. Ah, oh, beautiful animal. see what he's looking at. I think he's actually listening more than looking. Maybe smelling a little bit as well. I don't see that quick, sharp movement there. I think he's, he's hearing things rather than seeing things. See how he quickly moves his head. And how his sound comes from a slightly different direction. Oh, 
thing is there's going to be a bit of a shuffle as we take my big jacket off. It's warming up. intently. Some of those in Yala did run off in this area. I wouldn't recommend hunting already disturbed in Yala. They're probably on high alert at the moment. There you go, on the move again. if he heads where he's going now we might struggle a little bit with um signal he's heading down towards a very steep drainage system well good news Kirsty's allowed back inside uh, the internet seems to have come back on Christy. You should probably just stay outside in general. Oh, he's coming back this way now. He's heard something. Taxi's heading back down towards you. Again. Uh, he's stopped now, but he is heading down towards the Shkova. He hopes he doesn't smell Inyala on me. Uh, me too, Jenny. I think I've got most of the Inyala smell off me. Look at that. He's definitely heard something at the other side of that little drainage system. moment. Uh, Becky Hart in New Hampshire. I'm wondering if this isn't a Rebecca Hart. Uh, you actually used to be a camera woman on Wild Earth. Um, if it is, Becky, let us know, but uh, Becky would like to know what is that leopard's strongest sense. And I would say probably uh, their hearing coupled with their, their eyesight. It's very difficult to say, and their sense of smell is also excellent. I'd say le leopard in general, all their senses are, are very, very acute. Uh, but if you watch, I think they rely a lot on their hearing and their smell uh, and their eyes. I'd say they're probably all equal. You can see how the ears are moving constantly Ooh, like a radar dish looking for sound. Uh, 
Good morning, Sammy in Texas. Uh, Sammy would like to know how far does a leopard walk in a day? So they are capable of doing up to about 20 kilometers in a day, but on average, I'd say per night, from five to six kilometers. Uh, but they do tend to be, like most times, and they'll generally sleep for about 16 hours to 18 hours of the day. So we were quite fortunate. We did have him dozing early on, but since then he's been quite active, which is a real treat. And there we go. And he's done the walk by. I think he might be hitting. Oh dear. He is. Is he? Is he? Yay, he's not. He hasn't turned up here on the north, which is an incredibly bad signal area for us. Um, so, Janet has a version um, that often when we watch some of the younger animals, their tail betrays in the hunting. But with this male, he did not move his tail an inch. Guys, it's very likely I'm going to lose signal shortly while I go through this dip. So while we do that, uh, we're going to go see Jamie. And so again, for the second time this morning, uh, from some spots to some stripes. It seems as though this morning Andrew and myself just cannot seem to escape herds of zebra. Every road we go down, every corner we turn, there seem to be more of them wandering about, which is wonderful for us. We went through a bit of a patch where we hardly ever saw them. It's nice to see that with the green grass and with a bit of rain that we've had, they've actually moved back into this area. The stallion is off on the left there, hiding behind some trees. But he's a nice, handsome gentleman. We saw him a bit earlier. Most of them are, oops, sorry, turn that down. Most of them are standing off to the right here. And actually, I said that was a stallion, but this looks like a bachelor herd again to me. These all look like males. Just judging by the thin stripe between and underneath their tail. And that's generally the arrangement that you see with... Oh, there's another one. I didn't even see that one. Well done, Andrew. You can see how well that camouflage works. It's always surprising to me. Also another male, by the looks of things. And that's generally the arrangement you see with zebra. It's either a breeding herd with a dominant stallion, or you get these bachelor groups that move through an area. And essentially what they're doing is they're associating together for company. So to train themselves up, practice sparring with each other in order to be able to eventually one day compete for a herd of their own. It's nice to see such a big bachelor group. There's five of them that we've seen. Oh, just to let you know my plans, I've stopped at these zebra. I'm going to, I was on my way towards Arethusa, but I heard hyenas calling and I realized that I wouldn't mind stopping in at the den and just getting an update from that side, finding out what happened yesterday. When we popped by yesterday evening, it was only June out and about. Look at them all moving together. You can see how they disappear into one big group. I'm oh, that incredible sighting that Scott had yesterday and love three dogs. You're saying you have a brand new respect for zebra, having seen them chase the entire or push back 
the entire Investec wild dog pack yesterday. And absolutely, I always say that zebra are quite surprising in terms of their defensive maneuvers. I've seen zebra chase cheetah before, and I've seen them put up very brave attempts to try and chase hyena off a foal that one of them had managed to get hold of. They are incredibly courageous when they need to be. I've also been chased by a zebra myself, personally, and that was largely due to my puppy trying to investigate them and then deciding to run away through my legs, thus bringing the zebra very, into very close proximity with me. So they can be aggressive to each other and to various predators. And they're powerful animals. And those of you who've encountered the bite or kick of a domestic horse will know exactly what I mean. And these guys are particularly well adapted. They are not without defensive structures. Luckily, we've got this nice view of the zebra's backside because Brian wants me to explain the difference between a male and a female zebra. And Brian, what I was always taught was that the males wear G-strings and that they therefore have a thin stripe between the cheeks of their bottoms. Underneath the tail, that stripe, that black stripe down the middle. Oh, come on, boy. Come back out. That black stripe between the middle is very, very thin. In females, it's a much thicker stripe. It's essentially a finger's width versus three fingers width. And biologically, it's because the black stripe on the females is actually part of their external reproductive organs. I'm going to try and see if I've got a picture in this book. I haven't got all of my books with me just because it has been a bit rainy and I didn't want to carry my book around or too many books around in case they got slightly damp. I don't have a nice picture in this particular book. But essentially, when I find a nice example of a female, I'll also be able to show you, Brian. It's a little bit tricky with just the males. We need to find a breeding herd of zebra to show you. Let's see if we can get another visual of them around the corner. on the progress of the search for the wild dogs. I went up towards Cheetah Cutline and Booker's Cutline. Now yesterday we had an incredible sighting with Scott with the wild dog investing pack running around. And Sacrosanct, you were wondering if the wild dogs made a kill yesterday afternoon on drive, and they did. And what was amazing about that was that it was actually the pups that made the kill. The adults were running ahead, and as far as I can understand, the pups actually flushed a daker to the best of my knowledge, that they then managed to catch and kill. It was either a Dake or a Steenbock, it was never fully discovered what it was. You know how quickly wild dogs can consume a kill. It becomes really tricky to actually see exactly what it is they've killed. So it was either a Dake or a Steenbock, but fascinating to realize that the pups are already not only just demonstrating that hunt, hunting instinct, but actually acting successfully on it. And I've been out and I've tracked them a little bit. Now, yesterday there was one pup that was hanging behind the rest of the group, trying to nibble on the head of the antelope that they killed. And he got a little bit distracted and a bit separated from the rest of the group. It looks as though, just looking at the tracks, it's always difficult to tell, but just looking at the tracks, it looks as though the rest of the pack came back for the pup and then cross north from Cheetah Cutline into Buffles Hook. That was the last tracks I had for them. I've checked really carefully around Buffles Hook Dam just to make sure that I haven't missed them. And every morning I come down this road and every morning this Impala herd is there. This is their favorite place to come and sleep. And they're definitely having a late start to the morning. There's still a couple of them lying down. 
lot of it moved around. Isn't that fascinating that they've chosen a sleeping spot right next to the hyena den? That just goes to show. I'm going to move forward a bit. I just wanted to see what these lambs decide to do since they're all dashing. Morning, little ones. We're about 50 meters away from the active hyena den. And this impala herd has been here every single time that I've come through. This is their place. This is their spot for the moment. And it just goes to show how comfortable they feel around them, which I'm quite surprised by, if I'm completely honest. But maybe it's better the hyena you see than the hyena you don't. Look how big you guys are getting. nibbling away and while we make our way towards the hyena den shell you were wondering if i've checked any of the old hyena dens because apparently you saw a pregnant female on december 22nd which presumably is not what I, i'm sure you've double checked i know how much time and effort you have put into iding our hyenas and we do thank you for that you're wondering because you saw a pregnant female and obviously you haven't seen her at the active den if I've checked the other ones. I went and checked Gallagher Shortcut Den yesterday, but I will pay a little bit of more interest towards the filament cut line and Rebecca Dens. I have been checking for tracks though, and I have to be honest, I haven't seen any tracks going onto the regular pathways of the dens that they use. But that doesn't mean that there isn't another active den somewhere. And in fact, it could well be. We know of about five regularly used den sites. The hyenas have plenty of options. These impala are wandering straight towards the hyena den. Oh, while you've been with me, Brent's been doing some serious off-roading, as only Brent can do, and he's managed to relocate Tingana. So I'm going to send you back over to him for now, and I'm going to make my way across to the hyena den. So we found him again. He's gone into a, a, a creek bed or a drainage system. So we're about 40 meters from him. Unfortunately, we can't get any closer. And he's lying down there. Uh, if we came down, if we went down there, unfortunately, being right at the bottom of this sort of stream bed, uh, we would have uh, no signal. So he's sitting up on top. It's very thick. Uh, and I'm hoping if he does move again, he moves out of that area towards an area that's more accessible for us. Warm welcome to Betty from a very cold part of the world, Canada, or Ontario to be specific. Uh, Betty would like to know, are the trackers on the front of the vehicle in any danger? Have they ever been attacked? Uh, Betty, the only time I know of a tracker becoming seriously injured uh, was quite a long time ago, and it happened in the southern Sabi Sands, and it was more one of those fluke accidents. Uh, the lions chased a giraffe through the bush, and it fell on the tracker. Uh, but generally, they are very safe where they are. And as you can see, the leopards and lions tend to ignore them. Oh, he's on the move again. He's heading further up the drainage system. So we're going to lose visual for a little bit. I'm hoping he decides to climb out towards us. Uh, but if he continues on this 
direction. We will probably lose signal, but I will stay with him. He should come out. There he is. And to the right of that, uh, that guy, didn't you? You got him there, Tibbs? Here we go. Oh, flat cat. Um, I'm going to try get in there, but I might lose signal because it looks like he's gone completely flat. But I'm going to have to move quite a bit back around. Uh, if we do lose uh, picture, I do apologize. Uh, it might come back when we're not moving. Uh, but it is a very steep little system there that we've got to get into. Okay, so while we try to get into this drainage system, uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. She's arriving at, I know, one of our viewers' favorite spots. the hyena den and I definitely see some spotty action. Looks like some cubs playing. How oh, exciting. Let's go find out what's happened overnight. What these hyenas have been up to. Good morning. Hello everybody. I'm just going to turn the game drive channel down and while I do I'm just going to tell you a funny little story about the dangers of radio mics. Brent did broadcast a little bit of his conversation with the viewers over the game drive channel so the northern Swabi Sands did hear a little bit of that Tingana sighting <laughs> as presented by Brent. We've all done it, it does happen. <laughs> But it was highly entertaining for Andrew and myself to listen to. We got an idea of what it was you were all watching while you were with Brent. <laughs> and these two are having a wonderful game. This is purely playful. Not sure about the hyena on the left. The little one is definitely June. Ooh, ooh. It's getting too much, it's getting too much. In here, June. Hey, look at that. That was interesting. Oh, that was very brave, November. Coming to the rescue <laughs> before dashing away. Sometimes the games do get a little bit rough. And one hyena cub has to cry mercy. That was so interesting, the way that November barreled in there. Brave for a second before realizing it might be a bit much. <laughs> that one, the oldest cub there, showing quite a bit of dominance behavior. November's developing such a character. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love spending a bit of time. It is Corky. Is that Corky playing? No, it's not. So it was the one that was in the den site that is Corky. Probably sucking her cubs just out of view. They are the most fascinating animals to come and watch. And try as we might, we will never fully understand their dynamics or what's going on. People who have studied them for 30 years do not understand exactly what goes on at a hyena den. So they are always fascinating to watch. I think that's probably one of my favorite aspects about them. And as a fairly long-lived animal, I know that we had a question about exactly how long they live. Oh, that's quite smelly. I just got the wind just changed direction. Mm. Oh, this den is starting to stink. <laughs> 
Sorry, I'm distracted by the Cubs playing. So, Ross Craig, I haven't heard your name before. I'm not sure if you're a new viewer or just answering a question or asking a question for the first time. You wanted to know exactly how long it is that spotted hyenas live. And actually fairly long-lived. It depends on whether or not they are females or males. And they can live up to... The oldest hyena I've ever encountered in the wild was 13. But they can live up to 16 or even older if they're fortunate. As far as I know, the females have a slightly longer lifespan. But that, again, depends on whether they are high-ranking or low-ranking within the clan. It's one of those complicated systems. And also bear in mind, of course, that different animals in different areas will have different lifespans. So certain habitats are a bit harsher on the hyenas themselves. I'm gonna go forward a little bit so we can... It's always difficult to know where to position yourself at this den because they change direction regularly. Oh, my goodness, it's steady. a wide range of different ages at this den including some brand new cubs this is november so november's about two months old and cbs jonathan oh good morning where did you come from i think that's one of who is that i think that's one of the twins let's just come in So it gets very difficult because their sizes start to equal out. Look at that. But that's very submissive behavior. <laughs> that's a submissive grin, if I ever saw one. And then it's rolling over straight away to allow for gentle sniffing. Typical hyena greeting. Even November's coming up to say hello. Tentatively. Very tentatively. It's stretched out like the more I stretch myself outwards, the better I can move backwards quickly. <laughs> I was in the middle of answering whether we've seen the brand new cubs, which is a question that's come through. For those of you joining us for the first time, we do have two brand new tiny little cubs that have been showing themselves every now and again. They've been seen about two days ago with Scott. That was the last time I think that we've seen them. But there's a very good chance they could come out this morning. But this is just so... <laughs> this entire greeting is so fascinating. Look at the excitement in November's body language. Oh. <laughs> It looks like a very happy hyena lying there, but it could just be a very <laughs> submissive hyena. And you cannot mistake that for anything but affection between cousins. <laughs> Oopsie daisy, all got a bit too rough and tumble. Ouch, oh, thorn tree, <laughs> thorn tree. <laughs> Tangled up. Oh, you're so snarly today. morning. I'm coming up to say hello. I'm not sure who the largest one is. I'm uncertain. A couple of notches in its left ear. I initially thought Bella, but it's a little bit too big. I need to see the right side. I still, it's very difficult for us when we're sitting at hyena dens looking at the individuals in the flesh and keeping eyes in the back of our heads. It's quite tricky to immediately identify them. <laughs> oh, oh, got too close to Corky there, disturbed her. We 
we've got a beautiful setup at this particular den. A real family scene, and I feel as though this particular clan has done incredibly well, which is why we get individuals like this coming back across to visit. And Virginia, you were wondering if hyenas always dead in termite mounds. And the answer is, for spotted hyenas, I've never seen them den anywhere else. But that doesn't mean that they haven't in the past utilized things like rock crevices. Although that's generally more brown hyena. So the other species of hyena that we get, oh, anal pasting, making sure to add to this incredible scent that permeates this particular den site. And I'm going to come and have a sniff. And that scent carries so much information that we, of course, can't interpret. But for them is like a social media update. You can think of hyena anal paste as a Twitter status update or Facebook or whatever particular social media network you prefer, carrying all kinds of information. Relationship status, gender, Sometimes people suspect even mood can be carried in that anal paste scent. I've been distracted by something behind us. And what's wonderful about these shots is you get an idea of exactly how central we are in this clan and how comfortable they are with us. On the den entrance to the right, That I'm pretty sure is Madam. Oh, <laughs> just sitting watching November, who I've said has been, oh, somebody getting close to Corky again, being met with bared teeth. Always defensive or a little bit defensive around her cubs except where the matriarch is concerned of course and as soon as something happens along comes november to investigate and ellen you were wondering if perhaps november is a female she does seem to get into all kinds of things always around at the greeting ceremony always poking her nose into any kind of skirmish or disagreement and very very playful and was calling not, it's not unheard of, but was calling at quite a young age. It's always fascinating to watch. She's also very bold. Ellen, I think so, but I wouldn't guarantee it. I suspect that she is just by watching her behavior. But the thing about hyena cubs is that you've got to be so careful about making these assumptions. Yes, the female cubs are bolder, but at the same time, cubs don't automatically necessarily know their place within the clan. They're treated with kid gloves, so to speak, in their initial stages until they're taught as they get older exactly where they belong in terms of hierarchy. So it could be a precocious male that will eventually be taught its place. I suspect, though, that we're looking at a little female. I also suspect that November's mom, Pretty, is a high-ranking female, and I think that's a view that's shared by most of you guys who've been watching along with me as well. The fact that she was involved in that discipline fight that occurred a week or so ago. And I mean, that behavior is very precocious, I think is probably the best way to put it. Incredibly bold. But then also at three months old, it's also fairly normal behavior for a cub. They get incredibly curious at this age. We'll start to see it with the December twins as well. Lying off to the right there is the matriarch of the clan, suckling her cubs, at least I'm fairly certain it is. November having a jolly good sniff around her, which in itself is a brave move. Although I've noticed that the matriarch is exceptionally tolerant of November's presence. Whether or not that's because she is related to November and pretty the mother, 
or whether it's just because she's tolerant in general towards youthful cubs, having experienced their shenanigans plenty of times, this clan has done very, very well in terms of producing successful offspring that survived to adulthood. And Gretchen, I agree. I've said before, I've got a bit of a soft spot for November. That particular cub has been so entertaining. The star of Big Cat Week last year, or one of the stars of Big Cat Week last year, definitely highly entertaining to watch. There's nothing like seeing a very tiny hyena cub contact call. Who is that? I'm not entirely sure. And Ross Craig, while we're watching November munch on the sticks around her, you were wondering if hyenas eat anything apart from meat. And mostly their diet is carnivore based. The cubs are at the moment teething and exploring their world with their teeth. So they're not really eating the sticks around them. I've seen them eat grass much like, are you climbing now? Are you going to climb into that tree? <laughs> that's, that's how hyena cubs get stuck. I've rescued one before like that with its foot stuck in the fork of a tree like that. So yes, for the most part, um, I'll tell you that story in a moment, but for the most part, they are predominantly carnivorous. They will eat grass when they have upset stomachs, just like any other carnivore. The cubs chew on, oh yeah, you got a little bit too much, little one. That was definitely coming. <laughs> Discipline. Got to have discipline in a hyena, at a hyena den. Can't have toddlers running rampant. They are the opportunists. So if there is some kind of type of fruit, I wouldn't put it past them to have a nibble at it. They are famous for raiding dustbins of camps, which is why camps generally, it's very good practice to make sure, not just for hyenas, but for honey badgers and baboons and so on, so that they don't learn to associate camps with food. That's why it's good practice to have good secure dustbins to prevent them from getting into rubbish. They also on occasion chew on tires. That is not really for eating. It's more out of curiosity, but that being said, I have seen them chew and swallow. I have had them eat my oil caps that sit, the little round caps that sit in the center of my tires. I had one eat that once, despite my best efforts otherwise happened in two seconds when my back is turned. And I would say I've had some fairly interesting adventures. I have told the hyena cub story before, but just to let new viewers know, we were called in to say that a hyena cub had been caught in a snare. So we rushed out to the den site and we actually found that it was a cub that had climbed into a very similar setup to what we just saw November calling in and obviously jumped up and then hooked its paw in the fork of a branch. And because it was hanging, it was dangling, it couldn't get any momentum to lift its paw out of that fork and was completely stuck and the paw was starting to swell. So what we did was we just chased mom away, who was there and very concerned. And she stayed at about 40 meters growling at us, but there wasn't much that she could do. And we couldn't really leave the cub to lose its paw. And then we wrapped a jacket around its head because you really don't want to lose a finger to that. And we lifted it out of the tree. And it was an interesting moment. It's one of those moments where you question your involvement, but it was impossible to really sit by and watch the cub dangling from a tree when we could actually help it. It was also a very different system to this Kruger system. It was a closed system. In other words, it is a fenced area. Uh, 
interestingly, James Richards has said that November, first of all, has stolen his heart, although November has now retreated in a sulk into the den somewhere <laughs> after being nipped by the matriarch in an act of discipline. And James, you say that you're pretty sure that you saw the pinched tip to November's genitals and you were going to go and double check for us in your screenshots. Thank you. I appreciate it. I find it, personally, I find it very tricky. I'm going to come in behind that. Mm. Oh, this is a look up on that hyena's face. I personally find it tricky with young cubs to tell because the females, although the pinch tip is typical of males, for females that haven't yet bred, that haven't mated and that haven't reached sexual maturity, they can sometimes take on the look of a male genitalia. And for new viewers who are confused by what on earth we're talking about, if you are unfamiliar with spotted hyenas, they have one of the most unique reproductive setups of any animal. And indeed, that carries over into their social structure. So the females are bigger, stronger than the males, which is very unusual in the mammal kingdom. It's usually the other way around. The, ma the females are also pumped full of testost testosterone and androgen which has given them eventually over thousands of years, they've actually evolved an extended clitoris that's fused with their vaginal tract. So essentially they have a false penis. And it looks very much like a male's penis. And it's almost impossible to tell unless you really get a closer look. That's why the den site is the best place to try and judge an animal's sex if you haven't seen it properly. So the females are bigger but you can always get young females and older males that might be roughly the same size. And with sub-adults and cubs, it is very, very tricky. We'll have to wait and see with November in terms of aging her or him, it. <coughs> it's not going to be an easy answer. It's one we'll just have to wait for and work for. It looks like June wandering through. Now, I'm sure you're all wondering what has happened with Brent and Tingana, and I believe that he would like to tell you himself, so let's pop over there. So, welcome back, everyone. With Tebs and I sitting right on the edge, it's probably about five or six meters down to the bottom of this creek bed. Uh, we last had a visual, a very brief visual of Tingana in and around there. He could have crossed into this area, which is between two big uh, drainage systems like this. He could be just lying down right there. Unfortunately, even with my tenacious off-roading, we can't get down there. So uh, hopefully he moves out of that area during the day. Uh, I think a good place to look on the Sunset Safari will be around the Buffalzook waterhole, uh, or lack of waterhole. And uh, we're going to send you back to Jamie. We're going to go head out, see what else we can find. Hopefully there's some ellies or giraffe or some other fantastic creature that's about. But we'll be back with you a little later. It seems as though Brent has pulled, or Tingana has pulled a sneaky maneuver on Brent. I'm just watching this matriarch really closely. So for new viewers, she is the mother of our newest, uh, to the best of our knowledge, our newest set of cubs at this den site. So we're always waiting to see if they decide to make a little bit of an appearance. It was June that was coming through, so playtime is happening on the other side of the den. Ooh. Ouch. Gripped by the neck. that I've learned from observing the behavior of the den, which I actually never knew, is the fact that some of the females urinate at the entrance to the den, which is what's also passing across this particular odor to Andrew and myself. Andrew's scrunching up his nose. Um, it is rather smelly. And Richard, 
also goes by the username of Sir Richard. Well, Sir Richard, you were wondering about hyena urine and the scent that it carries. You were wondering if maybe I could describe it to you. Um, let me just try and think of the best description. Certainly ammonia is fairly high up. Now, hyenas are... <laughs> yes, you deserve that. You were getting a little bit too rough. Um, so hyenas are well adapted. They, as you know, can also inhabit desert areas, which means that they're adapted to go extended periods without water. It means that their kidneys can work extra hard at making sure their urine is as concentrated as possible. And the same would apply during this drought, which means it carries very high levels of ammonia, starts to smell a bit like uncleaned public lavatories, I suppose, is the best way of describing it. Also with a side of wet dog. There's a very musty, musky smell to it. It's not like the leopard urine that supposedly, supposedly smells like fresh popcorn to everybody in the world except me. I'm not sure what, it's, what is wrong with my scent of smell. Everybody says it does. Personally to me, I, I can't smell it. It smells like urine to me. But um, apparently it's, it smells like popcorn. And we'll have to take everybody else's word for it because I seem to be the exception to that rule. I know that Brent did touch upon it. What else would we describe the scent as? The problem is it also carries with it the personal scent of the hyenas and the anal paste scent. That's quite funny. <laughs> so I spoke about the smell of the hyena den, and then of course we saw that cub hyena, that cub anal pasting, and I said it was like a social media update. Susan, you you suggested maybe we should call it tweeting instead of anal pasting. <laughs> you can decide which way round that works. <laughs> I, Next time I see the battle pasting, I'm going to call it tweeting and confuse a whole load of people. <laughs> I like that, though. And Tina? who's watching in Houston, you've suggested that the visitor to the den, you've suggested that this could be Napandula, as named by Peter Pretorius. He was born last year. Oh, no, sorry, not last year. We're in a different year now, in 2014. Sorry, I haven't quite entered into 2016 yet. It takes me a while. I barely remember what day of the week it is or what month we're in. And Susan, oh, sorry, Tina, you mentioned that you saw a seven on that little hyena. Unfortunately, it's, it appears to have disappeared. I'm not sure where it went off to. We'll have to double-check screenshots when we get back. I personally couldn't tell you whether or not it is. A hyena that's fairly unfamiliar with me. Um, Tina, are you talking about this individual, the larger individual? And is the seven on the left or the right? I can't remember. I have been trying to catch up with some of the sub-adults that I'm unfamiliar with. You said it was on the right side, apparently. I'll keep an eye out for that. wandering off, off on a secret hyena mission for the day. As the cubs start to get older, they start to leave the den site and go wandering off on their own. And Jerry, Jerry who's watching in Australia, you'd like to know if the cubs will stay with the clan once they're grown up or if they disperse. 
For the most part, especially the females, will stay within the clan itself. And sometimes some of the males do as well. They've just discovered that it's a nice, safe place for them to be. It takes them quite a while before they decide to go nomadic. And also the fact that not all of the females at, in hyena clans are related. So you've got different family lines, which means that even if a male is born into a clan, it still means that he could mate with a female that is not related to him. So sometimes they stick around. But usually it's the males that go off and they go nomadic and they go wandering around looking for mating opportunities. Giddy fowl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't spotted anything. And just to go back to finish off Ginny's question. And Ginny, you were saying about cubs leaving. What does occasionally happen, and I've spoken before about coups, so exactly what I'm saying, like a takeover that might happen within the hyena clan where subordinate hyenas then start to become more numerous than the dominant ones and then look towards usurping their position in the clan. And sometimes what that leads to is almost like a, a schism in the hyena clan itself and the females wander off. Now I'm giving you information that has been observed, behavior patterns that have been observed. That being said, hyena clans and the way that they function in their social system, there's still so little that's actually really truly understood. So this is what we know now. We may discover something very different in the next 50 years of research into the way they operate. That's what I love about being here, is the fact that we may never know exactly how it is they're operating. Those guinea fowl, I think, have ducked over the top. They don't seem to have been bothered by the hyena. Corky is still fast asleep in the entrance to the left. No sign of her December cubs. I agree, Liz. Liz is watching in Wisconsin and really enjoys this den setup. I'm trying to remember how VM described it. He basically described it as moving up in the world, like moving to a bigger house or a nicer area. I can't remember exactly the words he used, but VM has a way with phrasing things that is absolutely hilarious on occasion. But I love the setup. The Tambuti trees, it's all sort of hidden like it's in a kind of a grove or a thicket. It means that the hyenas have per plenty of personal space and we can sit and watch them in really what is a truly quite an attractive setting, as Andrew is showing you. And what's even better for us about this particular den site is on sunny days, not that we've had one recently, but on the sunny days, there will be patches of shade for the poor driver and cameraman sitting in the bright sunlight. Although generally we don't spend our, the hottest period of the day around here. All has gone quiet and really all I wanted to do was pop into the den sites for an update to see what these guys are up to. Seems as though playtime is over. It's now time for the morning nap period. As you can see, all sleepy. Hmm. Now, if these hyenas were listening to the questions that were coming through, they would very kindly give us a nice yawn or something along those lines. Sometimes those moments happen, sometimes they don't. Either way, Mike, you've said that you've noticed that hyena have very white teeth, and you were wondering if I could explain that. Well, as with any predator, the best way to age hyena, or lions, or leopards, or wild dog, is to have a look at the state of their teeth. So that one hyena that we saw in the fight a couple of, or oh, a week or so ago, or ten days or so ago, had very yellow, quite old-looking teeth. It was actually how I said or how it came to the conclusion that it was quite an aged female. That being said, I think you're right, Mike. I think they seem to have whiter teeth for a longer period of time. 
Now I'm going to hazard a guess and say that's due to the fact that they chomp on as many bones as they do. Those of you who own domestic dogs will know that if you give them nice bones to chew on, obviously not cooked chicken bones or something along those lines that will, could cause them harm, but raw bones give a really nice tooth cleaning effect to the mouth as well as being entertaining for them and I guess hyenas with their dominant diet of bones that they can crunch probably help to tear away the tartar on their teeth. What is that? Can you hear squeaking sounds? The hyenas heard it too. Corky at least lifted up her head. Although she's now facing the wall of sand and going back to sleep. So whatever it was, hasn't concerned them terribly. But since they've I've all gone back to sleep, let's go and investigate. Almost sounded like zebra alarm calling. But it was so brief that I'm not entirely sure exactly what it was. And as our regular viewers know, with my earpiece in the right ear, I'm actually slightly deaf in my left ear. Maybe not deaf, maybe just that it doesn't hear nearly as well as the right. that escaped the hyena clutches. Sorry, Leanne, I'll be with you in a moment. Guinea fowl I have found highly amusing recently, but what we have noticed, we've been waiting for this moment, is that they seem to be pairing up into breeding couples. It's been a lot later this year than I've ever seen it before in the bush. It's, uh, I think it was guinea fowl that we're calling, or Franklin as well. Yes, so they've been pairing up, they, they pair up every breeding season into a male-female couple. But for this, probably because of the drought, it was incredibly late this year. Later than I've ever known it. So it's nice to see it finally happening. Wandering off in front of us. So they're still wandering in their groups, but when they split off around an obstacle or something like that, then you see them in their pairs, in their mated pairs together. I got distracted by guinea fowl. Leanne, you were asking about whether or not they're from the same clan. So I said yes, because of the proximity, where you were watching Tingana and the hyenas coming to investigate him is about, I would say, a kilometer at the most, so half a mile away from where we are now. That's very close. And to the best of our knowledge, this clan's territory extends all the way towards Torchwood, up into a little part of Buffleshook and then to the Triple M, or the western boundary of Juma. On, and that's where their boundary lies with the Arethusa Simobili clan. Difficult to say exactly, and obviously territorial boundaries are permeable, but I would say that almost certainly it would be hyenas, particularly in this core centre, since they always den in this particular area. This is the core part of their home range and their territory. So I think it's unlikely that an older hyena and a sub-adult would come wandering through from a different clan. Not impossible, but unlikely. Particularly so far into the territory of another clan. I would say it's almost certain. The individual that Andrew and myself saw on Gowrie Lane 
could that there's a slight likelihood more that it could be a stranger to the clan but even then i have to be honest i don't think so i think it's part of that clan as well the fact that it ran straight north into our clan's territory suggests to me it's also part of this clan <laughs> just bear in mind that any kind of interpretation that i give you on the hyenas and their behavior unless i tell you it's absolute fact if i could be wrong i'm giving you my best interpretation of the circumstances and what i'm seeing and what i've observed but nobody really knows if i'm completely honest exactly what happens within hyena dynamics Dens. I can actually still smell that particular one. It really is quite pungent, more pungent than I've ever encountered before. You know that when hyena dens start to become parasite ridden, obviously with the cubs urinating, defecating in the tunnels, the adults apparently urinating around the entrance, you can imagine that brings parasites. So what that means is that with hyenas, they move their cubs on a fairly regular basis. But obviously with the tiny little ones, one has to wonder about how they move them. And Christopher, you were wondering whether or not the cubs will walk with the females or whether they will be carried. Obviously, it is to do with their ages. I think it was the zebra that we heard. Is they here? And I think it's that stallion group. Oh, they're alarm calling at the hyena. That's what's happening. There's that hyena there. Just gave a bit of a yip to let it know that its presence wouldn't be tolerated. That's the old individual that we saw at the den, I think. They're the zebra stallions. Hmm. Interesting. You can see them all keeping a very close eye on it. Although hyenas in this particular area are primarily scavengers. I think it just, have you got a view there? No. I think it dashed off to the left. I'm not sure exactly where, somewhere behind the bushes. The zebra are still keeping quite a close eye on him. I was in mid train of thought. What was I about to say? Oh, yes. Although the hyenas are primarily scavengers, we suspect, not know, but suspect, that they have been hunting, particularly recently since there haven't been lions on Juma itself, although they have been right around the boundaries. Um, so I just wonder whether they haven't been hunting zebra. The foals are all out and about. I have seen hyenas kill zebra before, and this clan would be more than capable of taking down a foal. It might have been why they were on high alert, even with just one individual one individual wouldn't try and hunt these zebra alone as we saw the wild dogs they are more than capable of providing an aggressive and defensive response but i think they're feeling a little bit nervous and a bit shaky with that foal around what was i about to say oh i was busy asking answering the question about moving hyena cubs now it's interesting to watch when we first found Corky and the December twins, they were at Philemon's Cutline Den, and she was clearly making every effort to move them. What she would do is she would pick up one twin, carry it, because when they're so tiny like that, I think they do have to be carried. I can't imagine that it's terribly safe for them to go wobbling through the bush, particularly since hyenas generally move at night. You can imagine how difficult it would be for the mother to keep wobbly little ones safe. I imagine she'd have to carry them. So she would try and carry the one, and then the other twin would start to squeal in a panic that was being left by mom and sibling. So she'd drop the one cub and go running back to the den, and then grab the other one, and then as soon as she grabbed the other one, the one twin would have gone back into the den. It was utter chaos to watch. 
and we knew she was trying to move them. And then one day she just turned up at the Gallego shortcut ditch, obviously moved them overnight. So yes, they do carry them when they're young. And then once they reach roughly about November's age, and you've seen how sturdy November is on her feet compared to while we were watching her when she first made an appearance, he, she, it. You see how much more stable she is. I think that at this age, she would be able, she'd be capable of walking to a, den, a new den site, depending on how far away it is. Now they've moved recently to that Mbubu Road den, but that movement was a very short one. I think the distance covered was probably only about 150 meters. It will be interesting to see because now there's five cubs under three months old there. It will be interesting to see if the increased parasite load might cause them to move a little bit faster. of it. I mentioned to our viewers that I was going to go and check some of the older hyena dens and I have been past some of them and they definitely show signs of habitation just like the one that we saw this morning and Gubawala watching on YouTube great to hear from you again you were wondering if warthogs or warties ever make their way into hyena dens if the hyenas are not in residence and yes it's entirely possible that we do this morning we saw and suspect that an art park has moved back into that old hyena den so they could well be there but it's more than possible that warthogs could decide to inhabit a hyena den once they've exited residence that being said I would imagine, I don't know, but I, I would suggest that there's quite an extended time period between hyenas leaving and warthogs moving in. Just because, quite frankly, of the smell. Hello, you're in a terrible place. Okay, sorry buddy. Slamming on brakes in a very <laughs> uncomfortable slope for this little hinge tortoise. It's okay. You could cross the road. I love tortoises. I've got such a soft spot for the way that they move. He looks like he's gulping in fear. It's all right. I was not going to run over you, I promise. No, but you, that doesn't mean come under the car, though. That's not quite what I was suggesting. Ah. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh dear. Bye. Well, <laughs> we're gonna be here a while. <laughs> Pretty funny. Evie, who's watching in Long Island, just to finish off with our hyena sighting, since Andrew and myself will not be going anywhere anytime soon. You were saying that before you started watching Safari Live, you had no interest in hyena, and now they are your favorite. Uh, for me personally, they're my favorite predator because they've got such interesting... <laughs> I'm going to decide to come out from underneath the vehicle. Um, so yes, Evie, I love them. I find them fascinating. Of course, as with every animal out here, they have a darker aspect to their nature, just like any, they're wild. They've, it's, they've, they don't, aren't governed by the same rules that we are, and they react differently in different situations, just as they would for any predator. Now, I don't want to touch this tortoise because we're in the middle of a drought, and what happens when you do that is they sometimes panic and release the water that they have stored in their bursa. Um, I know regular viewers are familiar with that idea. And so we might have to wait for an extended period of time before he can drive away. So in the meantime, I'm going to send you over to Brent and see if my tortoise decides to move. So uh, we are now right down in the sort of western area of the Juma Private Game Reserve, taking a little gander. Uh, crew that has like this area and so does shadow so it doesn't look like anyone's driven here yet this morning 
uh, having a quick look for tracks. And for me, just a general catch up, I haven't managed to get too far around Juma uh, yet since I've been back. I mean, first morning, incredibly exciting. Uh, off the bat with the, the wild dogs running around hunting. And uh, obviously, uh, from the video I posted yesterday, uh, something quite unusual happened after drive. So we've been following the, the wild dogs for the majority of the, the sunrise safari and we had some fantastic views. And then unfortunately the, the rain got too hard for the equipment. So we had to head back towards camp. And I know Laura and lots of others are wondering if I go into more detail about our, our little accident. Uh, so well, let me just start at the beginning. Firstly, it started off with VM telling me, telling Scott and myself about that spitting cobra uh, that was in the kitchen during the night. It turned out not to be there, but it, so when we got back from drive, we covered up the vehicles to make sure they couldn't get any more damp than they already were. And uh, asked VM, it was still raining quite hard, if he would kindly take me across to uh, my house, uh, which is uh, a camp probably about a kilometre from uh, the, the DRC, the main camp where most people stay. And we were going to go and get the snake catching stick and go and see if we could find that spitting cobra in the kitchen. And we probably drove 15 metres from the entrance gate to the, 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 the Juma research camp. And, oh, I smell something. I think there could be some alleys around. Uh, and we were discussing actually the wild dogs we had seen that morning. And I was sitting on the passenger side, which is on the left-hand side of the vehicle, the opposite uh, to North America and a lot of places. And just, sitting and my head was facing forward we were looking forward it was it was quite misty and rainy so you couldn't really see around us and we came around a bush and uh, what happened was this sort of a bang like a car crash right here uh, against my head and the, and the window shattered onto me and then um, I, instinctively I think I turned like this and uh, the impala got stuck sort of between the dashboard uh, with its back and head against the windscreen and its legs facing me. And I actually remember thinking as it came through, no, in Yala, <laughs> and it started kicking. So I, I, I did this and I got a few kicks around the back of my head, also in my ribs here and the bottom of my thigh. I've actually got an Inyala hoof print sort of and a scrape all the way across the back of my leg here. Uh, and I, I think I remember shouting to VM like, uh, and then I try to open the door, but from the impact of the Nyala hitting there, uh, the, the, the door wouldn't open. So I, I shouted to Vim to open his door, uh, but I couldn't climb out because the Nyala was on top of me. So I, I'm not quite sure how I did it, but I managed to sort of um, grab the sort of back legs that were really, really hitting my legs here. Yeah? Yeah, and then uh, I just managed to sort of twist it and Vim had opened the door, got out and realized I couldn't get out. So he came back and he pushed, pushed the Nyala's head. And uh, eventually VM said it looked like I was sitting with a big dog on my lap. So I had the Nyala on my lap like this and I was holding it like this. Uh, and this is where I got all the uh, slight bruising on my face. Luckily, I don't bruise uh, very, very easily. And it was head butting me while I had it on my lap. And at the same time going, Bleh, obviously very stressed animal. I think there were three very stressed animals in the car at this stage. Um, and uh, then somehow managed to sort of unceremoniously dump it head first um, out of the car, out of the window. Uh, and then it, it ran off. And then we saw all the wild dogs around us only afterwards, obviously. I was quite focused on the, uh, the Inyala that was on top of me. I came off incredibly lucky. Uh, firstly, it was a female. Uh, if any animal, an impala or a young, even a young male in Yala, anything with horns, I think I, I would be looking a lot worse than I am now. So just some bruising here. There's quite a bit of bruising here. I also think my long locks and my cap took 
quite a lot of the blow. So fortunately, the the, the, the hooves didn't manage to to or broke the skin slightly. So I've got a few small cuts in my ear and um, behind my head here. The majority of the damage uh, seems to be on my legs because I'm sort of tap dancing on them for a while. Uh, and a lot of the re really, really, really uh, painful part was um, obviously all the shatterproof glass. It's tiny little slivers of glass went everywhere. Um, took a good half an hour with a pair of tweezers afterwards. Uh, I will try to post some pictures of the, the cuts and stuff. They're obviously under my pants at the moment. But with the tweezers, uh, taking all the little slivers of glass out. So that was that, that was quite painful. Uh, and, and with a lot of these things, uh, a lot of the, the really painful stuff comes later. So once you sort of calm down, your adrenaline's down, uh, sort of all the bruises and bumps you didn't really know about, uh, the non-sort of visible, the non-bleeding ones. So I got a really nice... Um, so <laughs> you know, I shouldn't laugh too much. It's quite um, um, sore ribs uh, and uh, lots of different bruises all over my thighs and that. I'm just really, really incredibly lucky that uh, it wasn't more serious. Generally, when you get an animal in a car, <laughs> it ends a lot worse uh, than it did for us. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the biggest loser in this wasn't the Nyala or us. It was, it was VM's poor car. Uh, but yeah, uh, so... Uh, you can have a look at the video to see what the car looks like. Uh, and we weren't filming when the Nyala jumped through the, the, the window, although when I did tell Graham, he thought I was lying uh, and said, no, no, this is like an early April Fool's. You've got to, you've got to be lying to me. You, this can't, can't be true. Um, uh, he wanted to know if Jamie was beating me for being away uh, in Zimbabwe with Andrew for so long. Uh, I said that wasn't the case. Uh, but so, yeah, it was, it, it was definitely not something that happens every day. And we were all very lucky that no one was, was serious, seriously hurt. And the video is on um, uh, my Facebook page, uh, and I will put it on Twitter again today for those of you who want to have a look. And you can see the damage uh, to VM's car and the amount of fur uh, that uh, came off that Inyala that is still inside VM's, like clumps of that orange, orange fur. But uh, as far as we know, the Inyala got away from the dogs. Um, I didn't see the dogs chase after it afterwards i think they were just as shocked as we were but the incredible thing was the sound um that initial sort of bang i mean you watch or videos or you've heard those car accidents with sort of screaming bang and, and it literally right next to you it was quite a quite a shock to the system uh fortunately we managed to manhandle it out the window again uh, a little bit shaky afterwards uh, and then a little bit more in pain than yesterday afternoon now, just sort of bumps and bruises everywhere. And uh, so quite lucky. Jamie had a good laugh at me trying to speak to my mother afterwards. I had a slight concussion, so gobbling the words uh, quite a bit. And, uh, well, Jamie got the strangest phone call of her life. As you know, yesterday was her morning off, so she was having a little lion. And then I uh, phoned her to ask her to bring, uh, bring me more clothes because I was covered in glass and all the clothes I was wearing was in glass. So I showered at the DRC to try to get the glass out of my hair. Uh, and, and off me, uh, and it took her a few seconds to register what was going on. Obviously, the other clothes also had quite a bit of uh, blood and whatnot on them, but uh, very lucky and uh, a <laughs> good story to tell, although it is one of those that almost seems unbelievable. So there we go. For those of you wondering about uh, Inyala versus Veeam and Brent, there's, there's the story. Uh, we're going to carry on now, uh, see what else we can find. I'm definitely going to be staying away from Inyala for a while, I'm keeping my, my distance. Uh, Smiles would like to know, should I be concerned about disease from the Inyala? And no, I'm 100% I'm, 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 I'm sure. I could have got a few ticks, but I think the ticks were still firmly latched onto the Nyala, and we'd get those anyway. Uh, with, a, with a lot of your antelope uh, and your, your herbivore species, it's very unusual for diseases to, to jump across the unlike carnivores where uh, disease and, and, and parasites, because we are omnivores, uh, we, can, we can share quite a lot of those. We don't share a lot of parasites with, with herbivores or, or diseases with herbivores. Um, there are certain ones, of course, mad cow disease and all that type of stuff, but those, those are very rare, and those generally come from uh, herbivores that have been farmed under sort of, uh, mass, 
So lots of animals together and in constant contact with people, uh, you get that jump over between diseases. But with a wild animal like that, I'm 100% confident I, I didn't get any diseases. Um, Nice big herd of impala coming up. No wild dogs behind them, no leaping in any direction. Uh, <laughs> Vicky on Twitter says, see, long hair does serve a purpose, yes. I think it really did help um, to stop those hooves going into my skull, which is fortunately quite hard. Uh, but uh, she also says that VM won't be taking me home anytime soon again. He actually joked about that. He says, I'm not going anywhere in a car with you. It's too dangerous. And strangely enough, uh, my doctor, who's got some of my around here, is uh, one of my best friends and one of my fishing buddies. Um, and when I phoned him to give him the update so he could give me a little uh, diagnosis over over the phone and over Skype. He just said, you know what, any other person in the world, I wouldn't believe it. But with you, uh, I can't, I, I, you get yourselves into these situations. How, Leo Smith, how? That's, uh, yep, that's that's what happened yesterday morning at about, uh, just after we finished uh, the sunrise safari. Here we go, you can see nice, it's still cool morning, so Quite a few of them pile are still lying down, chewing the cud, bringing up those boluses of grass and leaves to get the maximum amount of food out of them. Impararas. in Wisconsin and uh, says you can't believe it. Uh, our story coming back into DRC going oh my god you're not going to believe what just happened to us imagine the other going oh my goodness guys you don't can't believe what the humans did to me uh, I'm not sure who was more stressed at that time the, the Nyala or ourselves um, yeah and sort of throwing it back out at the wild dogs but uh, I, don't, I think the wild dogs are just as confused as as VM and I were. They're like, oh, dinner, where did dinner go? It went inside that white thing. So we're still having a quick look around this area, see if we can find any tracks of shadow or karula. Oh, yes, and I forgot. Uh, Jeannie and quite a few other people were um, asking about the, the spitting cobra. I blame everything on this cobra. Uh, the cobra managed to leave the kitchen at some point during the safari, so we're not sure where it is at the moment. Uh, I, I, of course, was in no state to try to find it. So thankfully, Scott uh, got the goggles on and the snake stick and we moved all the fridges and ovens. Because quite often they like to stay in the warm spots under the fridges and ovens. But uh, yeah, we emptied out that kitchen completely. The cobra had vacated. Now the reason you do find quite a lot of snakes around human habitation uh, is even though we think we can be quite neat and tidy, we're not. Uh, and even eating a slice of toast, you drop lots of little crumbs and whatnot on the ground, and that attracts rodents. Uh, and so they always have rodents around human habitation. So where there are rodents, uh, and quite a lot of snakes' favorite his favorite prey is are, are mice and rats. So snakes will come to try and catch the rodents. And during the winter months, they're attracted to the warmth of the fridges and the stoves. intended to jump in the car or, or, or not. 
Uh, Chrissy, I don't think so. I think he was trying to get away. Uh, I think we came out from behind a blind corner at the same time it was running. And uh, it's maybe tried to leap over the bonnet, but because of where we were moving and it was moving, it came through the window. But to give you an idea, we went and had a look at the tracks afterwards. Let me just show you guys quickly uh, how far it was between jumps. So I think even if it hadn't been trying to miss the vehicle, I think it, it was in mid-air, it was committed. There was no way it could change its, uh, its direction. So to give you an idea, how's this, Tibbs? Can you see my feet? Yeah. Okay. So say this is the Inyala track here. There we go. So all four tracks, bang. To there. So that's about the distance it was touching ground as it was being chased by the wild dog. So it was bang, 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 and then bang into us. So really, really uh, interesting. I mean, certain animals, I mean, the pilot can do eight meters in one single jump uh, in, in terms of longitudinal distance. So it is, it, is, it is incredible how these animals can move. So unfortunately, no tracks on Impala Road. And it's amazing if you look around us how green it is. Uh, a couple of days of overcast weather and even the tiniest amount of rain. And that sunburnt grass has already taken on a completely different hue. Uh, it's looking a little bit more healthy again. So the problem isn't now while we're getting these little bits of rain and stuff and the grass stays a little bit green. It, it's going to be sort of come from June onwards uh, after the rains when the grass hasn't actually had a time to, hasn't had time to grow. Uh, and where the, the, the herbivores will be having a hard time of it. So let's go across at the wonderful Jamie, who's got a visitor all the way from Europe. One of the beautiful bu bl <laughs> blue jewels of the bushveld. This incredible European roller. Beautiful bright blue bird sitting on the end of the branch there. And as Andrew slowly zooms in, you might notice the odd bob of the camera every now and again. <laughs> and that's because Andrew has the hiccups, which has been highly entertaining to observe. Luckily... <laughs> Luckily, as the incredible professional cameraman that he is, he still manages to bring you these sterling images <laughs> with just a minor squeaking sound from behind me every now and again, which has been, I have to admit, one of the most entertaining moments of my morning. I'm going to try and <laughs> contain myself. Every now and again, his head does a little bob, much like this European roller. I'm just going to be quiet, see if Andrew still has the hiccups. <laughs> Try and catch him out. Let's see if it happens again. No, they've gone now, I think. Have they gone now? OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the hiccups got the stage fright. <laughs> well, there you go. We found a cure for hiccups. Try and catch them on our live safaris, and apparently they disappear on cue. Oh, thank you for that, Andrew. It was highly entertaining. <laughs> Look at this beautiful roller. It's so incredible to see the bright blues and the greens and the purples of the various roller and bee eater species. Uh, European rollers have only really just started returning over the last two months or so. And we did see, for those of you who missed it, we did see the return of the carmine bee eaters just a few days ago on drive, which I think pretty much concludes our collection of migratory birds. So for those of you who are new to the show, what we like to encourage people to do is to start a bird list. And you can get well over, potentially, um, you could get over 300 birds. And I know our regular viewers are well over 100 in certain cases. Someone's on 200. Someone's on 200, really? Wow. Now that is impressive. 
It's almost like a treasure hunt in its own way. <laughs> oh, maybe that's what I should have done. Lois was loving Andrew's hiccups. And maybe what I should have done is give him some water. Sorry, Andrew. Mm. All I did was just laugh at you. She's <laughs> very sympathetic. <laughs> My apologies. Perhaps I should have offered you the giant five litre water that I generally carry around for such emergencies. Oh, he's sitting perched up on this branch, waiting for the opportunity to strike. And they are fierce predators of various cricket species, maybe flies, butterflies. Even moths will fall prey to something like a European roller. And it's always fascinating to watch them. Oh, open his beak there for a moment. You can see how he's turning his head, focusing that incredible vision that the all birds have and are famous for. Their eyesight is better than ours for the most part. And also, of course, there's no point in having bright, beautiful plumage if other bird species or other individuals of your species can't see it. So they have got the full range of color vision, as far as I know. They are fascinating to watch. And we've got to take these opportunities for the moment because they will be migrating towards April. They start to vanish off back up to the north. And actually, I wouldn't be surprised if that migration happens a bit earlier this particular year. We've spoken before about some of the fact that the birds have been moving towards the more rain-drenched or rain-blessed areas of this country. And they are moving to wherever there's insect population explosions. But definitely add it to your bird list, tick that off. Let's see if we can get other bird species on the list for you in the sunset safari. I know that Brent has been discussing that Nyala incident with you all. Of course, we're all very relieved that both him and VM are healthy and safe, if somewhat battered and bruised. And it's one of those aspects of being Brent's girlfriend is that he seems to attract these incredibly strange and totally bizarre incidents in the bush. It's one of those things I think I'm going to have to get used to in my life, is having phone calls like that first thing in the morning. I was, I was very confused. I know that Brent described my reaction. I, I, I had no idea what he was trying to tell me, to be honest. It didn't help that due to the slight concussion to the head, his words weren't coming out in exactly the right order, which in itself was fairly confusing, if only amusing in hindsight now that he's absolutely fine and well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been wonderful to have you on the back of the vehicle with us this morning. Thank you, Andrew, for your wonderful camera work and your highly entertaining hiccups. And thank you all for your questions and your comments that you've been feeding us through. We'll catch you this afternoon for the Sunset Safari. Have a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. I'm going to send you back over to Brent for the last few moments of our Sunrise Safari. Cheers, guys. So we're actually back at the scene of the crime now. Um, and you can see there's glass everywhere here on the ground. So these are the little tiny little shards that actually were quite painful, uh, taking the little pieces out of my legs. Uh, and as you can see here, there's uh, the elephant fence behind me. And you can see the, the wooden wall of our camp right there. So, I mean, literally right outside, we drove out there and that Inyala came through this bush. I mean, right past the back of the workshops. But, uh, yeah, so we're very, very lucky. Uh, I am checking very carefully in all directions that there's a, no Inyala about. I think I've got a phobia developing. I was, I was rooting for Tingana uh, this morning. But don't forget to join us for the Sunset Safari. Uh, it's been great having you with us. And I'll see you a little later today.